Yes, my name is Taylor. I work at Siler Tucker. I'm on the marketing team. She is just finishing up a meeting right now. Uh -huh. So I just wanted to come on and um, ask you a few questions if that's okay. Do you have any idea of when the air date will be for the podcast? Not sure. So Does it mean exit rich? Exit Rich is her book that's coming out. Ah, okay. So we will talk about her book as well, huh? Yes. The launch is on the 22nd, so Tuesday. Tuesday? Shit. Yeah. Then, then she will be the next on, uh, on my show. Okay, okay Tuesday. Thank you. Could you get it out before the 22nd, Martin? Is that possible at all? No. I'm, I'm almost perfect, so I will do it. Oh, you will? <laughs> Thank you, Martin. All right, well, let's get this party started. So you, when is the air date going to be on this? Uh, air date is tomorrow? When's the air date? Monday? I will edit it. I will edit it tomorrow. Monday? Monday, it's fine. Monday is fine. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. What kind of vibe do you like? Do I you like, like good energy. I like high energy. I like high okay, energy. So you, go, you like good energy. So Exit Rich is all about good, good energy or? Yeah. No, Exit Rich is all about selling your company. <laughs> We sell multi-million dollar businesses, very different. And says who? He, who says he's the number one broker? That IBBA, because he probably gives them a lot of money. You know, can't go by that. Okay, so your, your hey, ask him how many, ask him, ask him how many deals he's done all together. We've done over a thousand. A thousand deals. Yes, all together. I've done 500 personally. My, my the whole team has done a thousand. I've been in this a little over 20 years. And how do you feel after 20 years of, of that, that kind of I love it. I love what I do. Are you still alive? I'm still alive. You see me? <laughs> yes, I see you. <laughs> so I've been in mergers and acquisitions a little over 20 years. Sold over a thousand businesses all together. Personally, I've sold over 500 companies. Before mergers and acquisitions, I've always been an entrepreneur. I always knew I was not going to work for someone else. I knew I would never make a good employee because I don't like to be told what to do. And why? Um, why don't I like to be told what to do? I don't know why. It just bugs me. <laughs> it's my number one issue. It bugs me. I don't like it. it my husband still tells me what to do. He hasn't learned and. 20 something years, he hasn't learned to and, stop and, telling me what and, to do. And when you started, you were like uh, in early 20s or? Yeah, early 20s. Well, actually, yeah, um, early early 20s or maybe even before that. I've owned different businesses, invent space, publishing, magazines. I did get recruited um, from Xerox into for a Fortune 500 company. So I went to work for Xerox for a very short period of time and nickname became The Closer. Every time somebody couldn't sell a business or like I sell a sell a sell a copy of her sell, they would say, get Michelle to do it. She's a closer. She can cl sell anything. Within six months, they promoted me to high volume regional uh, vice president of a, a hundred salespeople. Really? And you were and, in early 20s or not? Yeah, early 20s. And I didn't and I didn't like it. Um, I didn't like it at all. I hated it actually. <laughs> Why? Was it too much for you? No, it wasn't too much. Nothing is too much for me. I like sales. I like problem solving. I like figuring out what my client's problems are. I like coming up with solutions. I'm solution oriented. I like to get things done now. I don't like to wait for things. And um, I like to build relationships that last a lifetime. When you go into management in a, in a, a Fortune 500 company in, in America, you know, you're having meetings to schedule more meetings, to schedule follow up meetings, and you can't really get anything accomplished because everybody has to vote on it, you know? Um, so I ended up leaving Xerox, going into franchise sales, franchise consulting, franchise development. I uh, sold hundreds of franchises. For, uh, I was a partner with different franchisors. 
And I had so many buyers asking me for existing businesses, but I didn't have any existing businesses. So I kept saying, no, no, no. And I'm like, why am I saying no? I believe in law of attraction, you know? I should be saying yes, yes, yes. And that's when I started my mergers and acquisitions business a little over 20 years ago. What does it mean for you? Law of attraction. Well, law of attraction means to, for me, you know, it means to, to visualize what you want. Um, for me, it means, um, you know, to put it out there in the universe, what you believe in and what you want. Everybody does things differently. I'm not one into meditating and I know I should be, uh, but I can't. It's very hard for me to, to, to turn my mind off. <laughs> my husband likes to meditate and I have actually tried it a few times. I'm like, this doesn't work for me. This is no good. Um, but you know, vision boards, visualization, meditation is good, mm -hmm. you know, um, positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I do that with my 10 year old. I have a repeat. Mm -hmm. I am smart. I'm super smart. I can do anything. Everybody loves me. I'm a leader. You know, I have her do positive affirmations every day and things like that. Anyway, that's really what started my mergers and acquisitions business. That's how I got into selling businesses. And then I, I learned very quickly that what Steve Forbes says is true. 80% of businesses in America will not sell. Now, that's a pretty startling statistic facing business owners because that means 20% of companies on the market will never sell. So that's when I started fixing businesses, <laughs> fixing them. Uh, so I really specialize in buying, selling, fixing, and growing. We buy businesses and flip them. I also um, partner with business owners, investing my money, my resources, my core competencies. I fix their business, grow their business, and put them on a, a built to sell model. And so that's, like I said, really our core competency at any given time. We'll own, own five to 10 businesses that I'm building to sell. Any personality traits that you think are important for being in your business? In my industry? Yes, for new entrepreneurs that are listening to us. For new entrepreneurs, if they want to start selling companies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if they want to start selling companies, or yes. if they do they need to be focused, persistent? What kind of energy? Well, do they need my to industry have? has a ninety-eight percent failure rate, so it's not for oh. most people. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in this industry, like I said, a little over twenty years. When I first got in this industry, I walked into a convention and it was three thousand men, and I was the only woman there. <laughs> So, but my industry has a huge failure rate. It's a tough industry. It's not for anyone. You know, if, if a, it's somebody who wants to be successful in this industry has to number one, have working capital mm -hmm. to support yourself. Number two, you really have to have great business acumen. You have to um, have a huge attention to detail mm -hmm. and you got to be empathetic. You got to be able to see all sides. And what's your formula for success why are you so successful uh, i don't think i'm so successful you know well my nickname is a closer there's one reason <laughs> my i've been called a little rottweiler when i want something i don't let go of it and um, i think just huge you know i have grit um i have a huge grit uh, perseverance um resilience and you know stickability do you have any daily routine or you are just like uh, go with the flow or? No, I have daily routines. I get, you know, the first thing I do is give gratitude for everything I'm grateful for. Um, I typically will get up at 4, 4.30 and work out for about four, an hour. 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then um, work out for an hour. I listen to Joyce Myers every morning. Um, and then I really write down the results that I want to accomplish that day. And I want my team to accomplish. I have a daughter that I get ready, you know, help get ready, get to school. Right now she's out of school. So that's good. I can sleep in a half an hour. I suppose you are not alone. You have the whole organization. That you yes, I'm not up. alone. Uh -huh. I'm not alone. If I was alone, I'd have a job. I don't have a job. I have a business. And that's the problem with most entrepreneurs that they, as they've created a glorified job in which they go to work at every day versus a business that works for them. So you need to have, if, if you want to be successful, you need to have some kind of organization, some kind of structure. If you want to be successful, you need to number one, get my book, Exit Rich <laughs> and read Exit Rich. And then you need to build your business on the proper infrastructure, the proper foundation, because so many entrepreneurs will start a business and they're successful 
right away, but then it's not sustainable. They can't scale it. So you really have, it's like when you build a house, if you just build a house on the surface level on the ground, what's going to happen when a strong wind comes by? Uh -huh. The house is going to blow over, right? So you have to dig deep and you have to build your foundation, right? Uh -huh. Same thing with a business. You have to dig deep. You have to build a solid foundation, a solid foundation, a solid infrastructure on what we call the, um, the ST six P's. And so these are people, product, processes, proprietary patrons, and profits. And I can go into each one if you want me to. Yes, please. But The most important one is people. Okay. So you don't build a business, you build people and people build the business. And so many entrepreneurs have misconceptions that their thought process is if I want to do it, if I want it done right, I have to do it myself. Well, that's BS. <laughs> you can't do everything yourself. You're not good at everything. So entrepreneurs have to stop, figure out what their strengths are, hire their weaknesses, and they need to start working on the business, not in it. And then they need to hire the right people, but put them in the right position. A lot of times entrepreneurs, and we've done it ourselves, we try to fit a square peg into a round hole and we're trying to make somebody into something or not. So I always say, you know, um, slow to hire, quick to fire, but you wanna put the right people in the right spots and you wanna ask a who question. Who opens the door? Who handles customer service, marketing, logistics, legal? Who handles quality control? The list goes on and on. The clue, Martin, is you never, you never want to put you next to the who. Uh -huh. You want to build a business that runs without you. The number one reason that businesses are not sellable in America is because business owners don't have a business. They have a job oh, and they okay. haven't built a business that someone wants to buy. Oh. Perfect example. I had a dentist that came to me. And one dentist, three dental hygienists. Uh -huh. And he wants to sell his business. The three dental hygienists are his daughters. No other dentist. And I said, look, I can sell your business. I can't maximize value because you and your daughters are the business. You and your daughters will have to stay on for two to three years. The purchase price will be contingent upon that. That will have contingencies like clawbacks, earnouts, seller financing. He says, honey, we're not staying. And I said, well, then honey, you're not selling. <laughs> So, so many entrepreneurs have jobs. We got to build that business and you want a layer of management as well. The entrepreneur should be the visionary working on the business. So that's number one, people. The number two P is product. So you notice I put number one, I put people first. People always goes first because you will never build anything without people. Uh -huh. Number two is product. When I wrote my very first book, Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth in 2013, I did the research and learned that 90% of all startups will go out of business. That's common sense. We all know that. But here's what y'all don't know. When I did the research for Exit Rich, I did the exact same research and I was flabbergasted to learn that the business landscape has actually flip-flopped. Now only 30% of startups will go out of business. So startups are not at great risk anymore. There are 30.2 million businesses in the United States employing over half the U.S. workforce. Huh. Small business is small. Small business is the backbone of the U.S. economy. Out of 27.6 million companies, those businesses have been in business 10 years or longer. 70% of them will go out of business. Uh -huh. 70. Uh -huh. So that's pretty scary for the economy because if we lose small business, we lose jobs. We lose jobs. We lose spending power, then more small businesses close. The number one reason for that is lack of aim. Mm -hmm. Aim is always innovate and market. Business owners stop innovating. I mean, in America, you hear about the big, the big public companies all the time. Toys R Us, 75 years goes out of business. Kmart, Steinmart, um, GNC is closing down 900 locations. Godiva Chocolate is closing down 1,500. Disney stores are closing. But the media doesn't talk about the private businesses on every street corner in every town, in every state. These business owners are exiting poor. They're selling for pennies on a the dollar. They're having to um, close their business or even worse, file bankruptcy. So product is huge because you're either in a thriving industry or a dying industry. Mm. There's really no in between. You're either growing or dying. So you have to ask yourself, 
Is your product, your industry, or your service on the way up or on the way out? Yeah. If it's on the way out, then if it's on the way up and you're like an Amazon, let's say you're an Amazon and you're in your prime, then what you need to do is sell because <laughs> you should always sell in your prime. You know, Toys R Us in 2015 had revenues of $11.5 billion. One year later in 2016, they filed bankruptcy. In 2017, they completely went out of business and closed all 1,500 locations in 35 countries. So you need to sell. They should have sold in 2015. Um, so that's product. And if you're in an industry that's dying, that doesn't mean you just go home, pack up and give up. You know, that means you got to figure it out. You got to pivot. You got to ask yourself questions like Amazon did this back in the 90s. They asked themselves, what business are we in? Every freaking entrepreneur needs to stop and ask themselves, what business are we in? Amazon said we're on book fulfillment business. We fulfill book orders. Then the second most important thing is what's your core competency? What's your USP? What sets you apart from everybody else? And Amazon said fulfillment. We do fulfillment better than everyone else. And then the third obvious question is what business should we be in? Should. Oh, should. Okay, should. Should. And Amazon said we need to be in a fulfillment business fulfilling fulfilling orders for everyone all around the world. Those three transformation questions transformed Amazon from a small mm -hmm. book fulfillment center to the multi-billion dollar worldwide conglomerate that they are today. So that's product. Also in product, so many business owners get this wrong and that's why so many businesses closed during a pandemic. Uh -huh. You gotta have more than one profit center. You can't rely on one profit center. So many restaurants went out of business because they get paid one way. When customers come in and eat or they take food out, that's how they get paid. Where's their e-commerce business? Uh -huh. Where's their selling some of you know their ingredients, their recipes, something that's unique to them? Where's their private label that they can sell to grocery stores and other retailers? The third P is processes. Processes. And most business owners get this wrong. <laughs> most business owners don't think about processes. It's kind of like exit strategy. They don't think about it until something bad happens and they're like, oh my God, we need a process for this. Processes need to be designed with the customer experience in mind, not based upon the owner's agenda. Have you ever noticed banks hours are nine to five, doctor's hours are nine to five, chiropractors are open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, abbreviated schedule, closed Tuesdays, open Thursdays, are they basing those hours, those processes on no, the, the no, patient? No, no, they're basing it on how much time they have to play golf. McDonald's started McDonald's back in 1950. Did you ever watch the movie The Founder? Yep. Yes, I did. Great movie, right? Very yeah, good movie. Mm -hmm. McDonald's started back in 1950. And they said, we want to create a fast food restaurant with a fast food system because there wasn't any. And they said, we want our customers to experience great tasting food that's hot, fast, 30 seconds or less. And do you remember when I went out to the tennis courts and I took chalk and I drew out all the processes? Yes. Yeah. Hilarious. So even though the processes were designed back in 1950, decades and decades ago, with the customer experience in mind, it's the reason that you can eat at McDonald's anywhere in the world and get the same experience. Have you ever dealt with a bank, a social media company, a retailer where you have a problem that you're trying to get resolved Absolutely. and you have to push this number, then this number, then this mm -hmm. number to get a live freaking person. You get a live person, you tell your entire story and they say at the end, oh, I have to transfer you. <laughs> and then they typically disconnect you <laughs> or they transfer you to someone else who can't help you. And you have to tell your story again and again and again. So business owners have to stop and ask, what do we want our customers to experience? Mm -hmm. If you don't create wow experiences for your customers, then your competitor will be happy to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they must be productive, efficient, well-documented. You got those process and procedure manuals. You have to have those SOP checklists. I mean, McDonald's can fire somebody and within 30 minutes have somebody hired and running you know, any position at McDonald's because of their SOPs. All of this is in my book. So Exit Rich is just not about selling your business. 
Exit Rich is all about building a sellable asset <laughs> because 80% of businesses will never sell. So if you don't get this right and build a business that somebody wants to buy and pay you top dollar for, then you're gonna be exiting poor instead of exiting rich. So Exit Rich is all about building a sustainable, scalable, and when you're ready, sellable asset. The fourth P is the highest value driver. The fourth P can take you from a five to a six to eight to a 10 multiple. In America, businesses that have under a million dollars in EBITDA, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, it's the cash flow of the business, will typically um, trade for any, anywhere around one to three and a half multiple, depending upon the synergies. But businesses over a million in EBITDA will typically start at five and up. So proprietary is the number one value driver because these are the synergies of your business. There are five different types of buyers. Buyers, con competitors, strategics buy synergies. They buy the synergies that will help catapult their current business to the next level. So number one, there's six pillars to proprietary. <laughs> number one is branding. The more well-branded you are, the more I can sell your company for as long as your brand is relevant in the mind of the consumer. Is anybody paying any money for Blockbuster? No. The most valuable brand in the world is, do you know? No. Apple. Oh, really? Apple's worth $359 billion. That's just a brand. That's not cash flow, inventory, real estate, AR, or anything else. Trademarks are also valuable. Trademark your company name, your slogan, your logo, your podcast. But don't make the mistake of getting just a state trademark. So many business owners, entrepreneurs will go to GoDaddy and they're like, oh, I have a business name and they'll type it in and they get the .com and they're so excited in it. And then they go get a trademark in their state, but they never check the federal database. So you could be operating for five, 10, 15 years, building up your brand and all of a sudden, boom, you receive a system to this ladder. You have to stop using that company name. So you got to get a federal trademark. If you're doing business nationally, then you need to get a national trademark. Okay. And then also trademark products. People forget about this. We're selling a company between 50 to $60 million. They have 12 products mm -hmm. and each product has a federal trademark and each product is exclusive to a, to a retail chain store. Like one's in Walmart, one's in Target. Mm -hmm. Patents are all also big. I don't think you have Shark Tank in where you, where you live, but Shark Tank, you know, always talks about patents, mm -hmm. pa utility patents, patent spending. We sold a company for $18 million. It wasn't making that much money, but they had 18 patents. Uh -huh. I understand. <laughs> contracts, manufacturing contracts, distribution contracts, vendor contracts, exclusivity contracts, franchisor contracts with franchisees, client contracts are the most profitable because buyers want to buy businesses that have reoccurring revenue coming in. Mm -hmm. But the caveat to contracts and the biggest mistake business owners make is they don't have the two sentence transferability clause. You must have that clause mm -hmm. because 98% of all deals are asset sales, not stock sales. Oh. And if, you're, if your buyer doesn't agree to a stock sale and your clients won't agree to consent to transfer, then you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So you need the two sentence transferability clause. Databases are big. You build up your database, it's been nurtured, you got your touch points, then you can make a lot of money for databases. Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And how much money was WhatsApp making? None. <laughs> they were actually losing money. They were hemorrhaging. Uh, celebrity endorsements are huge. We have a client that's got products with Oprah Winfrey. You know, strategists will pay a lot of money for that because everybody wants to have their products in front of the queen of everything. Oh. So uh, radio personalities, you know, um, that are endorsing your product, they can only endorse one vertical at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you have a skincare company and you have a radio celebrity and you have all those time slots, that's what we call digital real estate. Mm -hmm. Another skincare company cannot bump that skincare company off. It doesn't work. The only way to get that is for the current skincare company to stop the contract or a buyer to buy that business. Mm -hmm. And so same thing with internet. I mean, internet's huge now. Any type of e-commerce businesses that have some of the number one spots, let's say that you make pillows and you're number one on Etsy, or you make tables and you're number one on Wayfair, 
Oh, you sell coffee pots. You're number one on Amazon. All right, so proprietary assets are the highest value driver. The next P is Patreons. This is your client base. In America, most businesses follow the 80-20 rule, where 80% of their revenue comes from 20% of their clients. If they lose a client or two, they're in big trouble. And in America, most businesses have a customer concentration, where 50 to 70% of their business is tied up in one or two clients. Hmm. We sold a media, we were selling a media company for 15 million. They have five customers. That's it. That's it, though. But they had casinos. It catered oh, to casinos, oh. but they lost two of the five. Their revenues dropped in half. Their even had dropped in half. They were no longer sellable. We ended up merging them. And so the last P, the most important P to everybody is profits. Everybody's in business to make money. And everybody's like, Michelle, why do you put profits last? The reason I put profits last is because lack of profits is never the problem. Lack of, if you're not making money, that's not your problem. <laughs> you have to go back and look at what five cylinders, what five P's are you not operating on? I have clients that come to me all the time and say, Michelle, I have a profit problem. I'm like, no, you have a process problem or no, you have a people problem. If you're running on all five cylinders, you will not have a process issue. I can promise you that. Everyone can go find out more about me at SilerTucker.com, which is my main website. And then I encourage everyone to go out and buy Exit Rich. Exit Rich launches June 22nd. And just to tell you a little bit of information about Exit Rich, Steve Forbes endorsed Exit Rich saying it's a gold mine for entrepreneurs as they leave way too much money on the table. Sharon Lecter is my co-author who wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki. So she's a five-time New York Times bestselling author. She's a CPA, financial literacy expert, and the advisor to many different presidents. Plus, as a bonus, her husband is an intellectual property attorney. So she writes the mentor's corner after each one of my chapters. And then Kevin Harrington, the original Shark on Shark Tank, with the forward. So Exit Rich is not just not about selling your business. It's about building a sustainable, scalable asset. So when you're ready, you can sell your company. So you can go to ExitRichBook.com. We have tremendous value for anyone who pre-orders. For $24.79, we will email the digital download to you immediately so you can start reading Exit Rich today. We will deliver the hardcover to your doorstep for no additional shipping cost to anyone that lives inside the United States. We will give you a lifetime membership to the Exit Rich Book Club where there's video content of me doing lots of training and deep dives in these different techniques and strategies that I've been teaching for the last 20 years in the trenches. Plus documents documents to operate your business documents to sell your business so we have sample policy procedure manuals employee handbooks or charts sample letter of intent purchase agreements due diligence checklists closing docs all the documents you need to operate and sell your business are available for your review and your immediate download all of these documents are worth over fifty thousand dollars that's what it would cost you if you want an attorney to recreate, I know because I spent the money to create them all. And so you can get all of them for $24.79. Plus, we will give you a 30 day free membership into Club CEOs. Club CEOs is an entrepreneurship mastermind where we ask just transformational questions to help business owners pivot so they can build that sustainable, scalable, and when they're ready, sellable business. All for $24.79 at Exit Rich Book. Dot com.